Welcome back on the bus, bus riders. You've got the bus owner here today, and our show is incredible. A good friend of mine, Paul Gibbons from the Think Bigger, Think Better podcast. Before we get into that, if you're new here, you're experienced here, or if you just aren't subscribed, if you click the subscribe button below, that is going to help us the most for this show. So click that button and help us with the algorithm that is going to get us seen by the rest of the podcast community. That's right. Our bodies are algorithms, our plan is algorithms, and soon we're going to be overtaken by super powerful, all intelligent, sentient beings that you're not going to even be able to tell are just a built algorithm. But before that happens, we want your support. And what we've done, Brandon and I, is we've decided to send all of our intros to the end of the show so that you can just hop right in and get a great listening experience. But if you want to support us, skip all the way to the end, the last minute and a half, where you can find out our promo codes and things that we're giving out. There's one last thing that I want to share with you. Uh, actually, two. Brandon and I are going to be in New York next week, and we're going to be doing some incredible shows with people you're not going to want to miss out. All right? We've gone bigger, we've gone better, and you'll love it. As last, Lastly, we right now are giving away an On The Bus Podcast Athletics t-shirt. I mean, this thing is form-fitting, long sleeve, white, cooling. It's got the logo on the back with interlocking mesh along your rib cage so that you can breathe while getting in a fantastic workout. And you could have one of these On The Bus Athletic shirts by leaving us a five-star review and then screenshotting it and sending it over to our email at onthebuspodcast.com. That can help us support us review, algorithms, the whole shebang. So appreciate you taking the time out to do that. Now on to today's guest, a good, good friend of mine named Paul Gibbons. Now, Paul has an incredible backstory. He, at 14, he was in college. By the age of 20, 21, he was on Wall Street making millions of dollars. By 30, he was a drug addict on couch. By 35, he was CEO of a company. And here he is today, a expert on um, organizational change. He has a podcast called Think Bigger, Think Better, which is an extremely fascinating show. I'll get into that in a second. And he's just an incredible guy. Um, I met Paul 10 years ago, my first ever poker tournament in San Diego, California. We were sitting next to each other, struck up a conversation, and we've been friends ever since. I actually have lived with him almost every summer for 10 years, for nine years, in Las Vegas to play poker. So... I'm pumped to have him. The Think Bigger, Think Better podcast, actually, let me give you a little bit of background of that, is a show in which Paul has conversations with the leading minds to in the community of the biggest projects going on in the world today. So he talks about Tesla, gluten, um, democracy, politics, and you'll love his show. Go check it out. Think Bigger, Think Better podcast on iTunes and everywhere it can be found. And without further ado, let's welcome my friend, Paul Gibbons. On the bus. No, I'm not a writer. Okay. Give up on my way. You can see the sound. This is actually the second podcast I've done standing up. <laughs> this, Interesting enough. It's good. It's good. It's probably better. Yeah. Let's get a few punches out. So, man, the Think Bigger, Think Better podcast. I absolutely love your show. It's It's been great working with you. I think it's that British voice, <laughs> right? People love British voices. And remember how we, talk, how, we, how we talked about, you know, how we love listening to a men's voice and meditation and podcasts? Still confounds me on why we enjoy that i mean is that sexist or some inherent programming in us i don't know man i don't want to go into it. <laughs> i don't even want to go there but uh yeah it's just funny you think i have a british voice like like you know anyway we'll let our we'll let the audience we'll let decide. the audience judge right so you have a you have an extremely fascinating background actually you're in college by the age of what 14, 14 yeah so i wanted to start by giving, by letting you tell your story and your background and how you ended up where you are. Well, I, I see it like as uh, with me, it's like I, I had a lot of talent. My, my, you know, it kind of goes back to my parents. My parents came from my father, particularly sort of a white trash background. 
and he went and got his PhD. And so from his point of view, education was what lifted him from poverty and squalor. Yeah. Right. And so that's what I was brought up. So, you know, from the age of, you know, my parents, I was the first born read to me, you know, whatever I was reading at three, you know, they invested so much in me as a first person. So I don't know if I was born with any kind of particular genetic inheritance, but whatever. And I love my dad. So I followed my dad to a science lab during the day. I sat in on his chemistry lectures in college when I was 11, you know, so I don't know. It's and I ended up pretty smart when I was in high school, but then also I um, was prone to alcoholism, depression and attention deficit disorder. So my whole life has been a battle between, yeah, I got a lot of talent, but a lot of talent and no hard work or a lot of talent in the hands of an alcoholic. You don't produce anything of any value to yeah. anyone, not even yourself. Your life is fucking chaos, disaster. So that's the way my life was, you know. Uh, by the end time I left college, I was, uh, you know, full blown practicing alcoholic and cocaine addict. You know, so that's that's where I was at eighteen. I spoke five languages. I had nearly two college degrees, and uh, you know, I was a mess, unemployable. So you went from mess and unemployable, but you spent time working on Wall Street. That's right. I got into Wall Street. So where does a degenerate go with a drug habit um, with a you know, fair amount of intelligence to go to work on Wall Street? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I remember when I, was having, when I was having sort of the same background issues where I wasn't sure I wanted to go to life, highly intelligent, and the, the risky poker, where, where does a kid go who wants to make money is intelligent? They want to do something along those lines, anything that's risky and, and a lot of action and um, can give you sort of that young reward you get when you're that age. Yeah. I mean, I love trading. I, 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 and it was perfect for me. And, uh, you know, but then, you know, at, by the end of, uh, I don't know, the age of 26, I'd made, I bought a Jaguar sports car. I been making a million dollars a year for a few years when I was still young. And, and when you give all that money to someone who's a drug addict and an alcoholic is like putting out the fire with gasoline. So actually it made the problem worse. And so by 27, I was nearly homeless. Uh, I was living on my mom's couch or my dad's couch or shacking up with the latest girlfriend or whatever. So, you know, for about five years, that was my life. But also I was a professional bridge and backgammon player during that time. So I was making my money doing that. Um, but, you know, that, that was my life. And then finally at 33, I, I got sober. So, you know, from there, like if you're like me, alcoholically inclined, you know, if you're not sober, you can't do shit. Doesn't matter how clever you are or whatever. So anyway, I got sober at 33. So that's like 25 years ago. Were you, were you a high functioning alcoholic? No, it's incredibly low functioning alcoholic. Like there are people in Alcoholics Anonymous or people who are in recovery who get who are so high functioning, like whatever, they can get really messed up and they can be in the office at 6.30 in the morning and have wives and families. And somehow the alcoholism stays below the surface. No, with me, everybody knew. I never understood those people. Like the kids that smoke a lot of weed and they're, they do it every day. They go to work, they take a dab and then they're able to like crunch numbers and work till 8 PM while taking another dab in between. And I'm like, I want to go lay on the couch. Right. I, I'm like you, I mean, you know, there are people who could drink till four in the morning, get two hours sleep and show up and trade at seven o'clock in the morning. And I would take the day off. I just couldn't. So, you know, whatever. Anyway. So yeah, that was, that was it. I was very low functioning and, and you know what? Um, this isn't really about alcoholism, but thank God, because if I'd been high functioning, I would have kept going until I was 53 or 63 or 73 and it would have killed me. And a doctor told me when I was 27, you're going to die in early death. Your liver is like hundred years old. <laughs> he goes, we did some liver enzyme tests and you know, the liver cells are breaking down because of alcohol abuse. All of the liver enzymes are being dumped into the bloodstream. So that's the way they measure liver disease. They look at the liver enzymes that are in your blood and mine were off the charts. So whatever. So anyway, I got sober. Yay. <laughs> So how did that how did that whole experience and your story lead you into where you are today, writing books, organizational management, being a professor, and the truth, which we're going to get into later? Yeah, you know, I mean, I just needed to consolidate my life and get a job and get a career for a while and earn some money. So management consulting was a good place to be. Started my own company when I was around forty. Uh, the vision for that company was to um, bring some sort of sense of spirituality, of meaning, of purpose to, to business. You know, that was the founding principles of my company. And uh, they're still going today. I sold them, by, I think we're in our 19th year. 
now? When you say organizational change, like what, what were you doing exactly? Uh, we would work with organizations, either like big companies like Shell, for example, on either working with their top team, like their chief executive and the 12 people who report to him or her. And we did that for HSBC Bank as one of the biggest banks in the world. We did it for Shell. Uh, but you're doing what? You're, you're teaching them how to... A leadership development, which is partly personal development. So it's partially personal, personal growth. So one of the things a leader has to be able to do is to authentically speak their vision and values for the future and speak it in such a way as people go, fuck, I want to work for you, man. Holy shit. And Musk is, you know, world class at that. Yeah. You know, who else is world class at that Trump, right? Trump is one of the most engaging, uh, inspiring speakers. If you share his values of an entire generation, I mean, nobody has probably been, no political leader has been as charismatic as Trump since probably Hitler. Right. I mean, Hitler used to mesmerize cl- uh, crowds uh, the way people do at evangelical revivals, you know, it's like a, speaking. it's like a classic characteristic of a dictator almost. Yeah. Like, like that's, they have to be able to, to swoon the crowd like that in order to gain their attention. Well, I was studying Hitler this morning. I mean, just kind of went back. I never really studied history in, in high school. It wasn't very interesting to me, but he went from being unemployed and unemployable in 1919. He was a corporal out of the army to 1933 being chancellor of West Germany. That's 14 years. Unemployed, unemployable, no money, no connections, no job, no education. 14 years later, he's Chancellor of West Germany. It's, it's a uh, rise. I mean, it's just scary. Right? How the fuck do you do that, right? I mean, how does a leader do that? And that's a question of like, what skills does he have? What can we learn for that, right? Obviously, he was a morally bankrupt guy. But what can we learn from that that could be useful to us in the world? Because one people, you could just write him off and say, as people do with Trump, right? They just write him off. Right? They just yeah. write him off. The guy's morally bankrupt. He's inept. He's ignorant as fuck. He never reads. You know, whatever. You could say all those things about them, more or less accurate. But as long as we discard him and we're not willing to learn from what he does well, you know, I think we're missing a point. And so people from the left are like, if you say anything good about Trump, it's like you've broken the code. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's ridiculous, right? I mean, he's done some remarkable things. and But people on the left are unwilling to acknowledge that, which leads to this huge polarization we have today, right? Yes, completely. And on the right, of course, he's obviously... Perfect. Grown women, and, you know, yeah. and, and they're not willing to hear any of that, no. right? So you can't uh, think. And so that's that, you know, I say in the Truth Wars book that, like, normally you would want, like, there to be a bell curve distribution of political views, right? And you'd want to have the fringe, the cuckoos, you know, there'll be small amounts of fringe and cuckoo people on the tails of the distribution. And you'd want a whole bunch of people in the middle yeah, who are having intelligent, rational conversations about shit like trade or climate change or whatever, and trying to figure out some way to, to move forward. Instead, we don't have that. We have a dumbbell. We have a barbell, right? We have nobody in the fucking middle at all. And we have these huge plates on the end of the extremes. And so all the kooks on the extremes. And that's the distribution of people, in, it seems to me, in the media today and politics today. I view it the exactly the same. I view, the, I view as the left is completely unwilling to have conversations on some of the topics like gender and, and, and Me Too, all those movements. And then you have the right headlined by Trump who refuses to, to have conversations with the far left. Like, this is it. I have my demands and you don't like it. Then I'm going to shut you out until you satisfy demands. And then you have the far right who's like, well, I, I love that guy. I'm going to go with whatever the hell he says. Right. It's like tribal. It's like, it's like tribal reasoning, like trying to talk to someone rationally who's a Trump supporter about, you know, thinking differently about things. It's like trying to take a Jets fan and say they can support should, uh, you know, follow the Dolphins. Right. I mean, it's really like that kind of, sports team loyalty yeah well wh- why don't you think people today are willing to have those types of conversations just gosh you know here's the big question why aren't we willing to have rational conversations it's almost like it's almost like if i'm on the left and i'm talking to someone on the right and i'm unprepared as mr lefty to concede any ground whatsoever right i'm unwilling to say you know trump did a good thing going to north korea for example that was you know a bold so far policy. yeah so far, right? It, you know, may not work out, but whatever. But I mean, if I'm unwilling to concede anything, then you're going to be unwilling to concede anything. And so it starts with you. I'm, if I'm unwilling to concede anything of value in this conversation, then the polarization continues and someone's got to be willing to make the first move. Yeah. Someone's going to be willing to say, well, you know, the economy's very strong under Trump. Did he have anything to do with that? I have to be able to concede some ground and say, yeah, the economy's booming under Trump. 
I, I just have this weird thought all the time about how positive something like you're doing or like I'm doing with podcasting, this, the rise in popularity of this long form format where people can have intellectual dialogue and stimulate the other side. You have Sam Harris sitting down with Jordan Peterson who completely disagree with each other and they're having open format and discussions. But then you look out and people are, people are consuming this type of, of, of media extreme, like on the, on the extreme end, people love it. It's growing four or 5% per year. But then you look outside the virtual realm of dialogue of these conversations of what some people are listening to. And then you look at the media and what's being portrayed. And I think, wait, no one's having these conversations. They're doing the complete opposite. Everything is a confrontation instead of open dialogue. I mean, if you look at, yeah, I mean, it could be the great hope. I mean, I mean, that's what both Sam Harris and Jordan Peterson agree on is these kind of long form conversations are we need to be happening, but how many do they get? Right. I mean, even if they get 10,000 people for a live event, if, even if they get a million people, we're still, we're still at the fringes. That's still fringe, man. Trump got 60 million votes, Hillary 63. I mean, you know, okay. A million people. It's good. We're reaching some people, but I don't know. I, we want these ideas to reach more deeply into, into society. I think. Um, and I don't know how to do that. I'm trying with the podcast, right? Yeah. I mean, that's what I'm trying to do with the podcast. But um, and the book and the book Truth Wars that you're coming out with. and the book Truth Wars with any luck, yeah, with any luck. So I think one of the issues is the way that I view humans is we we tend to listen with one ear open. We tend to find the information that's being shared, and then and then that's what we listen. So I'm sure when you listen to a a debate between people, people come out with completely opposing who wins, who won in the conversation. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's very trouble. I mean, this thing we were interested in the middle for people who are listening to this today, we're interested in this woman, Christine Ford, uh, who's a professor who's accused the Supreme court guy of being, uh, groping her when he was in high school, getting drunk and groping her when he was in high school. And people already have decided who's right and who's wrong in this. So you have Senator Orrin Hatch, yeah, I think it's from Utah who said, I don't believe her. I believe him. But why would you arbitrarily, yeah, absent any data, just randomly make that decision? That's crazy. Or why would you randomly decide to believe her rather than him? Yeah. I mean, she's got one thing. She's taking a lie detector and there's, you know, that thing and she's told her therapist. So there's some evidence that she did just make this up on, on the spot. But all of a sudden, this issue where no, nobody has any facts, but everybody's already made up their mind. Nobody has any facts. Nobody can ascertain the truth or falsehood of what she said or what he says. But everybody's made up their minds. Well, what do you think is the biggest problem exacerbating that? Like, is it social media? Is it, what do you think it is? It's this tribal, it's this tribal loyalty. I'm not willing to concede that, oh, okay, I really like this guy. He's an honorable guy and he's had an honorable career, but he got drunk and fucked with somebody in high school. And, you know, they're unwilling to just concede that that could be true because of the consequences, you know, because he'd be unfit to be a Supreme Court judge if that were the case. So you're saying people are, are blaming genetics? No. Um, what am I saying? Tribal. I, I just, but, 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 some, but tribalism is, if, if we're blaming tribalism, it isn't sort of inherent in us. Like tribalism got sure. us this far. Sure, it has got us this far. Uh, or did it? <laughs> or did it? Um, I mean, it's been part of warring tribes has been, has been part of our history, right? Of course, it clearly has. The Europe had 500 years of religious wars until, you know, 16th and 17th century. So it has been part of our history. Has it been a, have we grown as we have as a species in spite of this shit or because? Yeah. And I think probably in spite. I mean, climate change is another issue where people are super polarized, right? Like you have a guy, you know, in a wife beater t-shirt drinking a can of Pabst Blue Ribbon beer who thinks that, you know, guys with PhD in climate science are full of shit and they're wrong. Everybody has strong opinions on climate change, right? All of us are ignorant. It's an extremely complex area. So how do you decide? And what happens is if you decide if I'm, my political loyalties are to the right of center with the Republicans, about 44% of people think climate change is a hoax or is, hoax is not real. That's an amazing thing because almost 100% of scientists say it is real and it's the biggest threat to think. But people make up their mind based on tribal loyalty. And again, it's like trying to persuade someone who's a Cowboys fan that they should you know, be a Raiders fan. It's that kind of irrational kind of loyalty to, to yeah 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 I know all about that <laughs> right well you're what Jacksonville Jacksonville yeah, Jacksonville Jags how they doing how they doing Sunday they're, they they won they beat the Patriots so, so they're they're two and zero and they beat two and zero and they beat the Patriots yeah I'm, how, I'm how happy are you yeah I'm pumped I watched the game <laughs> I, I I was kept quiet but this is the year I think we're gonna we we have the chance to win it so it's more 
when you have a shit when you're when you have a shit tribal community, right? You you yell and you break things because your mad things aren't getting better. But when you when your team is fantastic for the first time, when your tribal community is finally leading, yeah, like Cubs yeah. for example, like must be Cubbies fans have the same experience, right? Yeah, I, I I I it's a very different experience for when you've been poor for your entire life and all of a sudden you lead the forefront. It's it's this sort of like calm. We we're winners now. We expect this and. It's a whole different attitude. So Indeed. I really enjoy that attitude. It's like, it's like when you're winning in, like we both play professional poker. It's like when you're winning in poker and you're constantly winning and something bad happens or it's like, it's no big deal because you know that you're good sure. and, and, and you're winning. Sure. It's a whole different mindset and outlook. Yeah. Yeah. And, but I, I think the same thing comes in, in, in tribal communities. If you've been held down your entire life, like you're going to get mad over every little thing that happens. At least that's how I view it. If you, if you, if things have always been going fantastically for you and now all of a sudden, like they're going a little bit bad, eh, you know, like I'm going to fight, I'm going to fight against it because I don't want the downturn of our community, but it's still not such a big deal. But I don't know if other tribal communities feel the way that I do. I don't know. I don't know either. I don't know either. So I got a question for you. What do you, how is propaganda like social media? I look at, I look at truth. I look at social media as being the biggest purveyor of i don't know i don't even know if anything's Un- untruths, a propaganda, yeah, untruths. whatever yeah but like do you think the propaganda machine has a part in this like how is propaganda playing a role uh yes it is but you only see propaganda that you're already predisposed to liking so the algorithms uh only show you shit you want to see yeah i don't see anything on, i don't see any bright bart in my news feed do you well no. i don't know maybe you do you're a little to the right of where i am i don't see any bright bart i don't see any fox news feeds I see CNN, I see Box, I see Axios, I see Mother Jones, I see all the lefty shit. But, but don't you think that's actually a hindrance for you who wants to who wants to at least understand the other side in the debate? Yeah, there's a little. There are apps you can do use. There's one called Bust Your Bubble, which means that it'll throw some right wing stuff into your into your news feed. And and I, and I have subscribed to them, and I do want to know what they're thinking. Um, but I have a friend who was my best friend for like 15, 20 years in London. We used to party together. And he lives in Florida and his community is entirely right. There's something called the majority illusion, which is the way these algorithms work is there. If you never meet anybody who thinks other than Hillary lock her up and is, you know, has drunk the Trump Kool-Aid, you'll think that that's the only rational point of view. Like I've never met anyone. I've never met a smart Trump supporter, right? I do have a few people in Facebook who are Trump fans, but they're idiots, right? But there are Trump smart Trump supporters. I've just never met anyone because I'm in my little filter bubble. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, I view this as one of the biggest problems for social media is 100%. you're in I've talked about this on the show a few times, but you're in this, you're in a tunnel. You are. They are and it's they're trying to the way that social media works is they are in a competition with each other. Twitter's in competition with with LinkedIn and Facebook and YouTube for your time. Right. Yeah. And the more that they can get your time, the more you spend time on their product, clicks. which they make more yeah, money. Clicks. And how do they do that? Is they give you that little dopamine surge. They share things where you, you want. They give you that little dopamine hit from sharing some salacious bit of, bit of gossip about Trump if you're on the left or some salacious bit of gossip about Hillary Clinton on the left. It triggers that dopamine, the you know, the lower part of the brain, the below the cerebral cerebral cortex the irrational part of the brain and and you press click and like or share or something like that i mean the news on fake news and uh fake news travels uh approximately three times as fast as real news when you say fake news, like what's your definition well fake news, fake news is stuff that's you know made up i mean it's silly to call cnn fake news because you may agree or disagree they're not making up as they go along right right but there are armies of uh, websites in in Veles, Macedonia. I write about this in the Truth Wars book, which are pro-Trump websites, and all they do is they look around the uh, Reddit forums and the 4chan and the 8chan and all of these kind of things. They take these news and they make news posts. They turn them into like looking like a newspaper article, and it's got it's the craziest thing. Yeah, it is the craziest thing, and they 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 get paid for clicks and they make tens of thousands of dollars a month, and that's a fuck of a lot of money in Macedonia, by yeah. the way. These click uh, farms. Yeah. yeah, exactly. It's a click farm, and 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 so so that's what I call fake news. I mean, that's the reasonable definition of fake news is stuff that's made up just purely to get clicks, and then there's this sort of stupid definition of fake news, which is anything I disagree with. That yeah, you know, yeah. I've heard that <laughs> definition. I, I I think it's clever. It's a clever. It's a clever. It's a clever wordplay to make 
to shut people's arguments. But down. it's the worst. It's the worst because look, in, in a democracy, you need checks on power, right? That's why we don't have a democracy. Yeah. And since the founding of the United States, the idea of a free press to hold public officials to account has been sewn through the entire you know history of the United States and the history of you know to be fair Western Europe and Japan as well. You need the press to hold public leaders to account. You need the press for transparency. Otherwise, we wouldn't have discovered Watergate. We wouldn't have discovered the Iran-Contra thing. They need to, through investigative journalism, bring transparent stuff, which leaders would like to hold or peace. Why WikiLeaks is great, because they bring stuff out into the sunlight, which leaders would prepare for not be out in the sunlight. That's what we need. You know, I would say uh, sunlight's the best disinfectant, right? I mean, you know, so we need that transparency. And one of the things that an authoritarian leader does, and this is true of Hitler, this is true of Salem, and other authoritarians, they try and get a hold of the press. Now, in America, you can't have a corporate takeover of the press, right, or something like that, but you can undermine the credibility. And so there are people who think think today increasingly. So the press during in the 1970s had a 78% trust rating, right? You know, Pew things, do you trust the press to more or less report the news, right? It's in the 20s today. It's in the 20s today. We no longer have... Uh, uh, press that people trust to tell them the truth. We don't have a Walter Cronkite. He said at the end of every broadcast, I don't know if you remember him, you're not old enough. No, no. All right, you heard of him though, yeah, right? Yeah, of course. Yeah, so he was just dude. And that's what he said at the end of every show, and that's the way it is. And when Walter Cronkite said that, you believe that was the fucking way it is, yeah. <laughs> you know? And he was like one of the most trusted people in America. Right? We don't have that today. Anderson Cooper, you know, whatever. Or who's a Fox News dude? Um, I don't know. Whatever. William, like, we don't I, have I really anybody don't who we would agree is this is a faithful, someone who's faithfully reporting the facts to me. So I think that's a disaster. That's a real disaster. Yeah. I, I leave myself, it leaves me wondering if it's the undermining of who's in charge or if it's the, or if it's the social media networks or if we should be, if you said checks on power. Yeah. Checks on power doesn't just include the government. It should also hold accountable the corporations who are who are running our media. Yeah. So big, big food, big pharma, big oil. And I think they're just getting. Obviously, I think I have less of a view on corporations than you, like a more economic view on corporations than you. But, but you do. You're a you're a foodie, right? You're you're a student of uh, nutritional science, both from a personal point of view. You're interested academically, right? Processed food and sugar, according to some people who aren't idiots is killing people by the tens of millions. Obesity is killing people by the tens of millions. Heart disease is killing people by the tens of millions, right? The food industry, big food, has a lot, a huge role in that, processed foods and highly sugared foods, right? That's mm -hmm. unquestioned. But we can't really, you know, are they, they're just like too big to go after. Like, how do you go after sugar? How do, well, you know, sugar's in fucking everything. How do you go after government? How do you go after Google? How do you go after these, these, who's in check? Of these, who can people. check corporate power, right? Yeah, who yeah. can check corporate well, power? Well, I'm interested in the corporate relationship with the truth, you know, for the for the for the for the most part. So, how do they corrupt information on climate change, on vaccination, on sugar, on food additives, on gluten, on you know all of these you know topics? How is corporate influence? Because right now, uh, we have very slender checks on advertising. So there's some checks on advertising. None. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you know we have the Federal Trade Commission, which uh, is supposed to regulate advertising, but you know it's got a very tiny budget. You know, compared to the advertising budget of you know General Foods, come on, you know it's it's David and Goliath. So you know, um, and then regulators can never regulate fast enough because people on in Silicon Valley and people on Wall Street and people who are working in marketing departments of big corporations, they're fucking clever. Yeah, and they're, they're in, and they're innovating they're very smarter. quickly, and you know, you, data. and you've got a government schmo under under regulate under financed small government department, uh, the Food and Drug Administration or the Federal Trade Commission or the Centers for Disease Control, some government department that's trying to keep up with Wall Street or yeah. trying to keep up with Silicon Valley. <laughs> yeah, well, here's the thing. Here's the thing: is what they're attacking is the psychology of the human being. Yeah, they're attacking our unwillingness. And I, maybe it's not unwillingness, but our inability or our unwillingness to edu to fully educate ourselves on these things. And because of their access to resources and data and technology, they're able to do it at a much faster pace than we are to learn. Yeah. In school education, we're not teaching kids how to, we're teaching kids how to read a book and to learn, but we don't ever give classes on how to 
how to f- spot fake news. Well, it, we do, well we do, we but do now, we do now. So look, I learned history. History sucked when I fucking took it in school. I fucking hated it. I, lo- I love it now, right? Memorize these kind of silly, disconnected dates. You know, yeah. eighteen forty eight or eighteen sixty five or something like that, or these names of presidents or the capitals of states or all this bullshit is completely useless. Uh, today, my kid in high school, so that's forty five years after I was in high school. Um, I graduated in 1976, so uh, he's class of 22. <laughs> and uh, they're teaching them critical thinking. So they're actually, when they show them a piece of news, they have to say, what's the source? What's the evidence? How reliable is the source? You know, what contradictory evidence would make them wrong? They're trying to teach them. And that's the way people should teach science, and that's the way you should teach English, and the way you should teach history. Because science isn't really a collection of facts. Like the way they teach science when I was a kid was like you memorize things. There are nine planets. Okay, now there are eight or something like that. These are the names of, you know, the moons of Jupiter. Now there are 63 of them, so there are too many to name. But all of that kind of stuff's useless. It's useless for a citizen because what a citizen needs to do is when they see information on climate change, they see like in their Facebook news feed, vaccination causes autism and blah, blah, blah. New research says, scientists say, by the way, for your listeners, if it ever says scientists say, Compl- delete it before reading because they never do say scientists when they're speaking the way scientists speak will say research suggests yeah or, exactly it would seem to be or so far no, that doesn't get clicks from <laughs> so the as soon as it says science says you can disregard it the simulation knows science says this is your i mean in england they have these things in the daily mail or something like that science the new science of women's backsides you know and how scientists have now developed a way of measuring the perfect size and motion of a woman's backside. Well, so, I, I'm going to read that stuff. Well, that was, that's the best, right? Wait, so uh, my, my thing is, is and t- correct me if I'm wrong here, uh, is that I go, when I see an article, a science article, I tend to click the article and look around for the, yeah. the journal where it came from, if it right. exists. 100%. So that's critical thinking, right? Yeah. That's critical thinking. Who did it? Who wrote it? What are their qualifications? Are they citing evidence or something like that? I mean, you know, we and, don't and see where they were that's the from. kind of science you need to learn. Like, what is science and how does it work? And um, and if you don't learn that, and all of the other stuff you memorize, like the parts of a cell or, you know, the you know Cretaceous and the Jurassic and the Triassic or all these things that you might have to memorize, that's not that's not the science that is useful for people for making choices in their lives, right? The choices is, can I trust this piece of information that I've just been shown on vaccination? Can I trust this piece of information I've just been shown on gluten? Can I trust this piece of information I've just been shown on climate change? That's what you need because you need, you can't rely on authorities because in our media, when there's all of this, we have an information glut and poor information quality and anybody with a keyboard can be a journalist. You know, we can't rely on what appears in our newsfeed. We have to have the faculties to evaluate that. That's why the scientific method was the is the most important thing you could teach a kid, right? Right, hundred percent. Don't you think though that the government or yeah, the government? I'll say I'll just keep using the government. Don't you think the man is incentivized? Whitey. The, <laughs> there, but when I think about it logically, I I guess that the government is incentivized to actually not want people to think critically because then if they have some um, desired outcome from the macro part of the of the of the society, such as we want them to fall in line with the ideology of what our our tribal community suggests, or yeah. going to war, or yeah. we want them to have specific jobs that fit our our society correctly. If they start teaching people to think critically, then it seems sort of it's it would, a, it would create they, an immunity towards what they desire. We didn't want to do authoritarian governments don't want critical thinking. They want sheep. That's what my point. My my son's reading 1984 in uh, in um, in uh, in freshman English in high school, PAP English. They're reading 1984. They started by controlling what you think, and you know by that they rendered themselves immune to criticism. It bothers me so much that majority of people, me and you, can have this open dialogue and conversation about it majority of people they won't even think that that's a plausible part of reality and that's where it starts we have to get them to accept that that's a plausibility but you and i are interesting because i would say i would i would i mean i wouldn't i i call myself on the left and in america i'd be in the extreme left and any other country in the world i'd be smack in the middle but um but uh, and you would say yourself you're a libertarian right right you lean right 
Yeah, but you're a, liber- you're a libertarian. I'm but then you and I barbell. found so, and then we found ourselves on the barbell, right? I'm on the barbell. My I'm, dad would I, say I'm, I'm far left. Right. I'm a democratic socialist, so on the left, and you're a libertarian on the right, and so we're on polarizing ends of the barbell. And then we were having that car journey, and then we thought, oh well, what do you think about this? And we agreed. And what do you think about this and free speech? And we agree. And what do you think about free speech on campus? What do you think about me too? What do you think about climate change? We agreed on fucking everything. Well, so here we were. Realness we realness is part of our personality. Well, no, I'm not, not mine. Okay, well, I, I was joking. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm disagreeable to a, I mean, I'm intensely disagreeable. I'm, but anyway, we found, and so that's what we need is we started off like super polarized, but then we discussed a bunch of specific issues and we found that we agreed with 90% of them, right? Yeah. Yeah. And it was a great car journey because like, oh, what do you, I, you agree with me. That's interesting. So, uh, and that's what we need is we need, you know, we need to find a way for people who start polarized to begin to agree on, on things. So, I mean, uh, our, our openness to experiences yeah. is fascinating. We traveled playing poker. We got, we, we went to different colleges outside of our state. We've traveled outside the country. We've done things drugs we couldn't we couldn't we done. could we couldn't be more different though right i mean i'm 30 years old but, right? but we have openness that's yeah. the thing that we have we have yeah. willingness to listen to conversation yeah and intellectual and things that are intellectually stimulating which the openness allows us to see other perspectives to at least experience it whether we agree with it or not so that we can understand like most of my viewpoints are I view I try to view things from like how I view the world, not from myself. And you're doing the same. How would poor like how can we help poor people? How can we help X X person? Because you're viewing it from like this other person's perspective. Yeah. Whereas I think most people are viewing it from the singular eye. What's my world experience been like? I grew up in in let's throw Mississippi under the bus. I grew up in Mississippi my whole entire <laughs> life, and I'm in a kinship group with my family. Yeah. And all of a sudden I go to LA and all these people are wearing these strange clothes and acting like they're gay. And, and now they, <laughs> that's something that they didn't grow up with and understand. So that's a huge, like, let me kick that on out the door. And it's something that they're not going to get along with. But I do want to spin that into why social media actually has positives. Cause I still think that it's giving people access to those things. If we can spin, so, like if they're not stuck in a tunnel, if, if they were shown information from other sides, I think it would, it would benefit people greatly. The, the, the whole negative of it is you usually get in that spin cycle of people who have the same viewpoint as you. So if you post something negative about, yeah. about like the, the, the softies on the far left or the Trump supporters on the all right, yeah. then, then people are going to agree with you on your page because of those people seeing your stuff. Well, they, well, they do. Yeah. But if they didn't, it ha- would, I would say huge benefits. Well, I, I'm, I, I, I mean, I don't have that many right wing friends. My, I mean, I probably have 1600 Facebook friends uh, and probably, no more than 10 or 20 of them are, are right. I love them because, you know, I'll post something and they'll come on and flame me. And then my lefty friends will flame them. And it's fun. It's a fun. So, and, and no, I mean, that's when, the, that's the post that are, that's the post that get the most, uh, the most clicks. Right. But I actually love it. I love it that they're having dialogues. I love it that my, my, some of my English and European friends are talking to my American friends about gun control. Yeah. I love that. I love it that my friends who are kind of sciencey oriented and something like that are talking to my hippie friends about vaccination because my hippie friends, and by the way, it's not just the right that's anti-science. The left is anti-science too, when it wants to be. The left is anti-science on nuclear power. It's anti-science on GMOs. It's anti-science on vaccination. Yeah. You know, it's anti-science on, you know, alternative medicine. (laughs) An An old joke about what do they call alternative medicine that works? They call it medicine. Um, <laughs> 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 but um, uh, but anyway, um, yeah. So, I mean, I love these debates and I, 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 the world would be a better place if we had more of them, yeah. right? For sure. I'll give you a marketing, a marketing viewpoint. Because you're posting that and you're, that gets the most hits on your Facebook probably, right? Yeah, the most right. engagement. 100%. So yeah. when I'm learning on how to create engagement for a post, for social media, for a client or for yeah. something along those lines, yeah, yeah. what the directions that I've received is you might not be interested in sort of a topic that's being flung around the death of Anthony Bourdain or some speech that Trump has made, Kavanaugh, what's going on with Mueller. Those things might not interest you. You don't want to do it. But you, you want, hate to, talking but you want to hop on them anyway. But if you post on it, people engage and it creates engagement for your stuff. And know, so it's like this I conundrum. Know. It's this conundrum where my, you my don't sister, want to talk about My it. sister's a marketing pro and she always says that you need to, you know, read the news and you need to somehow, 
you know, I need to be part of this debate with Christine Ford and Kavanaugh, or I need to be part of the debate on global trade, or I need to be part of these things. And I, I don't find myself easily able to do that. First of all, I've got like a schedule, right? I want to write a certain amount of hours. I want to podcast a certain amount of hours. I want to play poker a certain number of hours. So, you know, I don't really find myself able to react to click, you know, clickbaity. We should call this podcast Kavanaugh, Kavanaugh versus Ford, right? You probably get a lot of clicks. You, you'll get a ton of clicks. It's it's not something that I'm familiar with. I'm, I'm, at, I'm, I'm definitely in the category of people that doesn't like to talk about those things. Um, well, like politics. Here we are today, though. It's, this is a stimulating conversation versus talk, like battling it out on Kavanaugh versus Ford. Yeah. So, I mean, the difficulty you and me are having is that you and I both, like in some respects, both want to change the world. Yeah. We both want to be known for the good work we're doing. So you're doing great work on On the Bus and I'm doing my work at Think Bigger, Think Better. So we both want to grow those. And I want to grow them partly for egotistical reasons, right? I want to grow them because I want to do, don't want to do a schlocky podcast that gets 1,000 downloads. I want to do a podcast that gets 100,000 downloads, right? I want to do something that succeeds, and I think you do too, because that's part of what fulfills human beings is achieving things. But I also want to add value to the world. Like, I just don't, I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to write a book that was like a clickbait book that added value to nobody. So I want my podcast to actually stimulate some discussion and, yeah. and to move some issues forward. Uh, and I know that on the bus, that one of the things you're interested in cultural understanding and you're interested in travel and you're interested in, you know, uh, millennial, uh, uh, what do you call it? When people can work from wherever they want to work. Digital uh, nomadicism. D- 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 digital nomadicism. And you're just some things that are important conversations for the world, right? I mean, you're leading the charge on a lot of that stuff. So we both want to make a difference. We both want to be recognized for our work in a very noisy world. Right. And I, your podcast is awesome. I'm told mine is awesome as something like that, your, but it's hard to get it noticed. Right. Right. I mean, you know, it's in a world full of noise. It's hard to get a noise. You really need to stand out these days. I'll, I'll be completely honest. I think your podcast is incredibly well done. I've told you this over and over again. And I'm happy to be working on it and helping you. It is extremely thought provoking. It's like, I'm listening to some of the, some great professor that I never got in college. Yeah. Give me a, a good talk on depression or I'm listening to a statistician tell me about, about how important math is into making decisions. And that's the kind of thing that I think is important. And I know you have Tesla and some of these other projects going on. I'm actually curious, do you see any, are there any trends from that you get from your guests? Like anything that you feel as if you heard from all of them at the same time? No, you know, my, one of the things is I, so my, one of the, one of my great podcast, great strengths and biggest weakness is how eclectic it is. So the first one was on a New York times bestselling author who wrote a book on the presidency. Right. And then the next week was neuroscience and the next week was fake news. And the next week was critical thinking. And the next week we were back to neuroscience and then we were on psychology and then we were on business and then we were on politics. I did one on fake news. So it's all over the place. So I had one on depression recently. I had one another one on politics recently. I've had one on business recently. So it's all over the place. So for some people that's like, awesome. Yeah. And for some people, it's like, where's the focus? Like, what am I, what am I known for? So there's that, the eclecticism. And I also go for the highest quality guests. So if I go for a company, I'm going for the chief executive. If I'm going for someone on gluten, I'm going for the biggest motherfucker in the world. You know, I want to get Pearl Mutter or Frisano on gluten or something like that. So I do go for the very, very big hitters. Uh, um, so, so here's, so here's, a so that's, what's just, that's, what's, I think is good about think better, think better. That that would be the center of the brand is that I go for the biggest people that I can possibly reach. So one of the things that you do is you like to not only paint a picture of the biggest projects that are going on today, but you like to analyze the science and see if it's, you like to, to break down things if they're bullshit, right? Right. right. So debunking. Yeah. That's debunk. Love. Do you love it? Do you, that's a classic contrarian move, by the way, it's a classic contrarian move. Right, right. And the question that I have for you is from the majority of people that you talk to, are they, are they positive? Are they positive on climate change? Are they positive on, on plastics? Are they positive on health? Are they positive on, on the future of politics? Are people positive or are they negative? Oh, uh, my guy in depression was very positive. I mean, he actually said that 25 years, you know, we've made enormous progress already. And that 25 five years from now will have made even more progress. I mean, defect, de- depression afflicts like one, one person in five. So, you know, it's no small thing. You know, families and, you know, people lost productivity and, you know, lives that are full of misery rather than fun. I mean, it's an important, it's an important thing. So he thinks that's positive. Um, I, know, I, I mean, know. most of my people are being positive. But remember, we live in the United States. So I mean, the United States is like, like the super, most positive country in the world, right? 
Yeah. So that's an American value. It's a very attractive value, but it yeah. also, you know. I think we're also the most, like, people in the United States are extremely depressed. Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe, I maybe. Think teen, are all teenagers depressed or is I that, don't know, man. Is that just us? I don't know. My kid right now is like, I'm like, you know, I want to slap him and, you know, wake up and, but, uh. I don't think people understand depression that aren't depressed. Like, it's this cavernous hole. Oh, yeah. Get out and do something. Yeah. Get out yeah. and do something. Yeah. 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 Hey, man. Hey, look at the bright side. Yeah. I don't know if I could fucking look at the bright side and get up and do something, then I'd be, you know. <laughs> yeah. You can describe it as yeah. something where nothing that you do makes you happy and all you want to do is lay in bed and it's like a chemical. Yeah. Nothing, nothing that you do makes you happy. None of the things. And if all of my dreams came true tomorrow, I'd still be miserable. miserable. And if I, even if I got up and wrote the chapter of the book, I'd still be. So it's fatigue, it's unhappiness, it's uh, trouble sleeping, it's trouble eating, it's, you know, all of those kind of things. So yeah, my podcast impression is worth listening. If Actually, if you know someone, uh, there's some diagnostic tools on there. If you know someone or if you yourself are afflicted, then it's a really great podcast with one of the number one guys in the world. So I'll tell you for me that my depression, my like lifelong depression was cured from, I didn't test these two things. And obviously there could be tons of other variables, but when I started meditating and when I cut sugar, my depression went away. And when I get depression now, it's like fake depression. It's not real depression. It's like, not it's the not, bone crushing, the, go away world depression. Yeah, it's not of the, the like yeah. suicidal, I want to die, I can't yeah. get out of bed, I can't yeah, sleep. Yeah, yeah. And I really think that, you know, we talk about sugar and I'm, the, I'm not a scientist, but I, from anecdotally, getting rid of sugar and, and meditating was like the cure-all. I couldn't even go back if I wanted to. Sometimes I've tried to fake depression, like that feeling. Like it was such a big part of my life. And, and I try to fake it. I know you felt that. So. Yeah, no, it's a huge, it's a huge thing for me. When uh, Truth Wars didn't get a publisher back in last uh, December, uh, you know, the wind was taken out of my sails, uh, and yeah, you know, I, I spent you know six months trying to figure out what to do, and and you know, I feel great now, and I'm back writing Truth Wars again, and I'm podcasting again, and I'm playing poker, and I'm winning again, and you know, I'm firing in all cylinders there, and I'm dating again. Just in case you have any listeners who are curious. <laughs> so, so let me ask you this: Do you think we can re we can reteach people how to learn truth? Uh, I don't know. Learning truth that I can't I can't I don't know how to do business with that that's kind of a weird. We'll rephrase thing. it. Like, um, can we I, I think I mean critical thinking. So critical thinking is is one of the things that how we can need we do to it? Teach people to do. well. There is a book. I, mean, I do a podcast on critical thinking with a woman who wrote a book on critical thinking and it's what they teach in schools right now. It's basically, look, okay, here's what I use in my MBA class. You read Goldilocks, blah, 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 blah. And she walks in, uh, this porridge is too hot, blah, blah, blah. This chair is too hard. This bed is too hard, blah, blah, blah. It's a two page children's story. Right. Yeah. And you read that like, yeah, yeah, yeah. What the fuck, what the fuck, what the fuck. Right. Okay. So critical thinker goes, what does that say about Goldilocks? What kind of person is she? What kind of virtues does she have? Is she the kind of person that you would want to associate with? What was her relationship with the bears and forehand? What assumptions did she make? Where do you think she was brought up? You know, all of those. And I thought, I read this, like this is something that I use to teach as a teaching tool in my MBA class or something. Like that. People go, oh, fuck me, there's more to it, right? But we read things like, oh, yeah, 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 I know this, right? So if you can actually train students, like my kid is being trained right now, to think critically about, and, and, and high schools are picking this up and colleges are picking this up. It's like, what's the meaning? What's the below the surface? What's not being said? Who's the, what's the source? What's the evidence? What's the quality of the evidence? All of that kind of stuff. So I think that's the great white hope. It's great. I think, that's the, I think that's the great white hope, man. I really do. I think it's teaching people how to think. Um, and then we can basically parse information for ourselves. We can hold our political leaders to account. So when a political leader says... Blah, 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 caused blah, 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 blah. If you're a critical thinker, you go, that's not a fucking cause. That's a correlation. And it's not even a good correlation. And it could be a million other things. So if we can teach people to think like that, we can hold politicians who are the master spinsters to account. We can hold corporations to account when they talk shit to us. We can hold alternative medicine or even big pharma to account if they spin shit to us, if we can think critically. So that's the idea. So what, what do you think? So Elon Musk came up with this idea where he wanted to hold journalists accountable and he called it Pravda, which is Russian yeah. for truth, for truth, right? Yeah. So he wants to create this site. For those who don't know, it would be a site that sort of collects all the data and reviews uh, from journalists and whether they reflect the truth and are honest and open in their, their dialogue. So how do you feel about a site like that? I feel like I know the answer to that. Uh, 
I mean, sort of like yay in a way. I mean, I have the hugest admiration for journalists. Yeah. I, I really do. Um, it doesn't pay great. And, um, you know, there are very few Anderson Coopers. And for every Anderson Cooper who are, there's a thousand motherfuckers who are, you know, sweating it out, making $75,000 a year trying to make their name, right? trying to become Anderson Cooper, right? Yeah. Uh, so um, they do a, a service to help us understand the world of scientists and what scientists are saying, help us understand the world of politics, help us understand the world of economics, help us hold power accountable. Um, and so I have nothing but admiration. And I think uh, journalists is actually one of the highest integrity professions. I think there's because it's part of the DNA of journalists. And that doesn't mean that every journalist who ever has walked the streets of the earth has been a high integrity person. There have been some famous scandals where people have made shit up. But by and large, I think journalists are the people in society who are really, really committed to the truth. Uh, really, really committed to bringing the truth to people. And I say that even about people like, you know, the people who work at Fox News or something like that. I mean, even people who, you know, the journalists at Fox News, not the opinion people at Fox News. I mean, they're seriously committed to bringing the truth to people. Um, and so, yeah, so I have nothing but admiration for them. Now, they have fact checkers today, which is a great innovation. So when someone claims something, if you go to Snopes or if you go to factcheck.org, You'll read pages and pages. So if Trump says the economy hasn't had a quarter like this since since the 1920s, right? There'll be three page analysis of what he says. Well, it's basically it's garbage, right? But um, but you know why is it garbage? And here are the numbers. Um, or you know, and and that work cuts both ways. It cuts both ways on the left and the right. The left makes some extraordinary claims. The government is going to take away your. The Republicans are going to take away your health care. You know, if you're old, right, you're going to take away your Medicare, right? No, no, they're not, <laughs> you know. Uh, so, so, you know, all of that stuff, that fact checking thing, I think is something that um, if your people don't avail it, it's if your listeners don't avail themselves, go to fact check or go, go to Snopes.org and pick your latest conspiracy theory, you know, um, pick something that you've heard and just type it in and you'll see an excruciating amount of detail about whether it's factual or not. And that's a great hope. So if Elon Musk's idea is in that vein, I think it's a great thing, you know, transparency and accountability, man. You know, it's why the Department of Justice needs to be independent of the executive branch, because we need to hold power in check, right? There need to be checks on power. So, yeah, attacks on the FBI and attacks on the press, I think are unhelpful to our democracy. We've been going for an hour, man. What are we going to do? How are we going to wrap this up? Oh, you want to you want to make an hour and a half? Yeah, I got some final questions. I think I think an hour I, I think an, I think an hour is good. Yeah, no. So I appreciate you coming on. I we got a I got a last segment that I'm gonna. All right, shift, gonna run shoot it my shoot it my way. We're we gonna talk right. about poker. Yeah, no, so I'm, I'm gonna ask gonna, you one poker question. One poker right. question. One poker question. One, one one poker question. The first question is was a poker question. How did you know? It's who is your favorite poker player? What poker player do you identify with the most? Actually, like Kate Hall. <laughs> I actually think she's she's one of the smartest. People. I read her feeds. Uh, Explain who she is for the audience. Oh, uh, she's uh, she was a very highly paid lawyer who uh, gave it up to uh, become a professional poker player. Enjoyed quite a lot of success very early. Um, she's super super left wing, and um, she attracts a lot of heat from people who aren't. And um, but she's super super clever. She's very transparent about she's having some troubles with mental illness in the moment. She's super, super transparent about that. And I just think, uh, you know, she's an admirable, she's an admirable person who's a flawed human being, but is trying to make her way in the world and do the right thing. Um, so I think she, I'm, I'm a big fan of hers, but um, she's also deeply, deeply unpopular in the poker community. Yeah, she, she's very polarized. <laughs> yeah, she's, she's very, very, polarized, po very yeah. polarizing, but she's a right, right on. Um, it's an interesting thing for me and you, because obviously poker is very lucrative and very like if I played poker full time, I would make butt tons of money. You know, I don't know how good I would be. I don't know how good I could become. I'm already plop profitable and I only play 20% of the time, 15% of the time. I don't study that much, but if I threw my life into it, I can make a ton of money. But right now it's around the edges of my life. And so, um, you know, it's hard to do. And it's how I pay for all this other stuff that doesn't pay. Podcasts don't pay and writing books doesn't pay and that kind of stuff. So I play poker to generate enough 
enough income to pay for the rest of my life. So wow. and I've been lucky enough that that's, that's happened for 10 years. So I've been sort of semi-pro for 10 years. I envision a blockchain world where someday <laughs> are, everybody's going to be paying a micro cent to consume content. It's going to be such a little amount of money that they're not going to know. And every time they create a video and put it up on YouTube, they're going to get paid micro pennies and then they're going to build up their own income so they can do other things. So if we did an ICO of our podcast or something like that, and people could contribute micro cents. And if we had a billion people contributing a micro cent to our podcast, we'd do fine. Yeah. I think it should be auto taken from your account when you listen. So like a 10th of a penny, every time someone listens to your podcast, they wouldn't notice. That would be interesting. Well, maybe even a penny wouldn't be really, I mean, the nickel wouldn't be noticed. And you pay when you consume content. So it's it's a fair economical system. I kind of like that. I kind of like it. And there would be a marketplace for content too. Like the New York times could charge. Yeah, Right now everyone's doing content. The New York charge could charge, New York times could charge a quarter an article and yeah. It's taking you, a, it's taking you, it's going to take me two years, two and a half years to build a, a consumable audience. And it's going to take in, in a podcast or a YouTube channel, you can put up great content, but it's going to take a year before you're found by people minus hiring some agency. So what's a better system, right? Or what's a system that truly exploits or incentivizes the, the quality? Everyone gets paid and the high quality stuff gets found and gets paid more. It's just, it's really simple. That's not that simple. Okay. <laughs> no. Last question for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So if you could pick one project that humanity is working on right now that you think is the most important for us to be working on, and then you could work on it in some way, shape, or form, what would it be? Or you well, could, you know, talk about it. Well, we've won the wars on health and on famine and disease. So that great book by Yuval Harari that we're both reading. So those were the big victories of the 20th century and the 19th century on disease, on famine, on poverty, right? It's not to say the game's 100% won, but we won 80% of the game, right? Yeah. China lifted 500 million people from poverty over the last three decades. That's a lot of it's really That's a, a lot of it's fucking people. A lot of fucking people. So, you know, we haven't won and we have to figure out how to distribute the benefits of capitalism more equally and whether that's, you know, which part of the playing field we level and how level do we want our playing fields to be and whether we try to level the playing field in kindergarten or it's even before kindergarten. And, you know, okay, interesting questions. But a lot of those wars have been won. So what are the wars for the future? Well, I don't think we can take democracy for granted. It's a relatively young experiment. And I think the rise of, right-wing populist movements around the world, sort of quasi-fascist movements. I mean, it's silly to expect a fascist movement from in the nine, in this decade to look like a fascist movement from the 1930s. People go, no. where are the brown shirts yeah. and the swastikas and why aren't we not throwing Jews in concentration camps? No, but we're throwing fucking kids and their parents in concentration camps. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, in a way, so we, we, we think, and we need to, we need to protect our democracy, I think, at all costs. I mean, I think that's... Um, that's the most important project. And not because, you know, we're lucky, right? Um, Western Europe, the United States, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, and all those kind of countries, you know, we, we do have. To, but I don't think we can take that for granted. Um, and so we need to protect it. And what do we need to protect it from? We need to protect it from assaults from within and assaults from without. So the biggest assault from without in democracy is the effect of money in democracy. That's the biggest assault. Um, concentrations of wealth. Uh, infecting the political system. And it's the problem is worse in the United States because of the cost of running an election here. Yeah. Whereas in Canada, they had a, an election that took a record length of time. You know how long it was, the pr- last presidential election in Canada no. for prime minister? No idea. Six weeks. <laughs> In England, when the prime minister calls a general election in England, we need stuff now. I, be, I believe it's six weeks. In America, the American people are already starting to campaign for 2020, right? For 2020, that's two and a half years away. It's a, well, it's it's a two years it's and two a months. Machine, the election cycle. But I mean, so that's one thing. But I mean, we also need to protect it from corporate power because I think we accept right now, um, and it's partly been codified in law in the United States, that Citizen United, that you know, un, unlimited, more or less unlimited financial contributions to campaigns. I just don't think democracy can tolerate that. I don't think democracy can tolerate the kind of lobbying we see. That's one I agree with you a thousand percent. Right. We can't just tolerate that stuff. And so we need to get a way to get money out of politics because that's what true democracy is. You know, true democracy is, the, you know, your vote, vote, how much your vote counts isn't proportionate to how much money you have. Right. Yeah. So, it, and it ought not to be. And so that's one of the things. And you also need to protect it from within. I mean, I mean, there's a very great book called On Tyranny, which is about a 90-page book 
by a Yale professor called Timothy Snyder. And he compares our time to the 1930s. And uh, one of the things that he's quick to mention in the book is that Hitler was democratically elected. He was democratically elected and became chancellor in 1933. And between 1933, he set about dismantling all of his enemies, throwing his enemies in jail, and dismantling the institutions around him that made West Germany a democracy. So West Germany was a democracy until it wasn't a democracy, until it was a dictatorship. And we need to be aware of how that happened in the 1930s to protect ourselves from it happening in in this decade right now. Um, So, you know, we also need to protect capitalism for itself right now as well. You know, capitalism is, has you know, been part of the battle against disease, against hunger, against premature death. Um, It's brought, uh, I say, half a billion Chinese out of poverty. Um, So we've won a lot, but we need to protect capitalism from capitalism. By that, I mean environmental destruction. Um, By that, I mean abuses of wealth. By that, I mean inappropriate concentrations of wealth. We need to stop capitalism from self-immolating. And so protecting capitalism and democracy is a really important thing to do, which is a strange thing for someone on the left to say, right? But, you know, that's very, uh, that's very much. So I think that's the most important project. That's the most important project right now, protecting democracy and capitalism from within and without. Very important. Very important. Uh, there's a lot of important projects going on. It's hard to, it's hard to pick one and be like, this is the most important one. I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So look, Paul, thank you so much. Obviously, not only All that, right. but it's been a blessing working on your show. It's been a blessing. It's been great. It's been a blessing, you know, working with you. And can I pitch the show to people? That's exactly, that's next up. I want you to pitch where the sh- where people can find the show and then social media and everything, anything you're looking to pitch. Well, go to Think Bigger, Think Better on iTunes. Uh, go to my website, paulgibbons.net, and there's a page called Paul Gibbons Podcasts. And it has a complete inventory of episodes. And, and go ahead and just give one a listen. Um, and you may not like all of them. They're very eclectic. There are 20 episodes. The show's been going since December. So paulgibbons.net, I mean, uh, you don't have very many corporate monkeys listening to this. But I, I do, you know, paid speaking engagements for ridiculous sums of money, 10, 20 grand a pop or something like that. So I'm always interested in incoming requests for that. Um, and find me on Facebook, the Think Bigger, Think Better podcast on Facebook. So yeah, love to hear from people, love to hear suggestions for podcast guests, Uh, love to hear people arguing with my guests and saying they're full of shit and saying I'm full of shit. I love that. So yeah, thank you for having me, man. Thanks. Much, much appreciated. Bus riders. This man, Paul Givens has, I'm telling you, a spectacular show. I'll put all the information in the show notes so you can find where it is, find him on iTunes and all the other places. And last but not least, I have to to thank each and every one of you for listening to the show. If you come this far, you might as well listen to the last two minutes because that's how you can support our show. Or if you're in the beginning, we threw all this stuff at the end so you wouldn't have to listen to intros. Thank you for coming this far. You can shop through our Amazon portal and receive a hel- well, if you shop through the Amazon portal, you can receive anything because Amazon has it all. But what you'll do is you'll support our podcast. We receive a percent of what you pay for. You can find that on our website right at the bottom. And we, me especially, lovers of CBD, Green Roads World, greenroadsworld.com. I use a CBD product, two of them every single day, a tincture. And I also take the topical cream, rub it right there square on my tushy, and it helps my hip. And you can do that with the promo code on the bus with no spaces and that's greenroadsworld.com and finally thank you so much for listening to our show we love each and every one of you if you leave a review five stars and you send it to our email on the bus podcast at gmail.com screenshot a photo and you will get one of our on the bus athletic t-shirts first eight people are going to get a an on the bus athletic t-shirt it's form fitting it's got mesh sides it's like you're wearing under armor but it's on the bus once again, thank you, each and every one of you. We are off. Oh,